One of the strange things that's going on is it actually robs indigenous people of their agency. And this is so funny because in the humanities and liberal arts, you say, oh, well, we want to make sure we give voice to the voiceless. Well, that's only if the voiceless are saying what you want them to say. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. You know, when I was at my son's hockey game the other night, um, even before the playing of the national anthem, we had to listen to something called um, a, uh, a an Indian um, uh, land reconciliation announcement. Um, and so it got me thinking about how do people feel about this? Um, and uh, and today we have a guest on who's going to enlighten us about this on, on some key questions. For example, was North America really stolen from Indians? Uh, was Columbus a racist? Uh, were Indians really peace-loving, communistic uh, environmentalists? Did Europeans commit genocide in the New World? You know, it seems that that everyone from government to the media uh, to angry students pulling down statues of our, of, our, of our founders in the United States and Canada have bought into this narrative, but there are really good reasons to, to be suspicious of it. And so our guest today has uh, written uh, an, a wonderful book. It's called Not, in, Not, it's called Not Stolen. And uh, he's a renowned historian named Jeffrey Finn Paul. And in the book, he systematically dismantles this uh, relentlessly negative view of uh, U.S. history. He also talks about Canada, arguing that it is based on shoddy methods, misinformation, outright lies about the past. So welcome to the program today, Professor. It's great to have you on. Thanks so much for having me on, Leighton. Okay, before we introduce you more properly, uh, as we always do, we're going to go to our framing aphorisms. Um, some of these are, are pulled from people, characters in your book. Um, the first one is Julius Caesar, who famously said, I came, I saw, I conquered. The second one is from someone who is featured uh, prominently in your book, or at least a discussion of him, Christopher Columbus who wrote, weep for me, whoever has charity, truth, and justice. I did not come on this voyage for gain, honor, or wealth. That is certain. Next from uh, Chief Joseph, very famous uh, Indian chief, who said, hear me, my chiefs, I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. And finally, from an uh, author named Antony Burgess, who said, colonialism, the enforced spread of the rule of reason. But who is going to spread it among the colonizers? So who do we have on the show today? Well, Professor Jeffrey Finn Paul, he's a historian at a global top 20 university who has gone viral on telling the story like it really was. He was raised outside the historic Moravian settlement of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. His upbringing instilled love of history from an early age. Later, he lived in the American West, Mexico, Canada, the United Kingdom, Spain, Belgium, and the Netherlands. He's also studied Spanish history, receiving his PhD from the University of Toronto. He conducts historical research in eight languages, including Spanish, Latin, Catalan, French, Italian, Dutch, and German, plus his native English. And uh, he's written dozens of uh, scholarly books and articles. And he won the 2016 European History Quarterly Prize. He co-edits a book series on global slavery and is area editor for the Journal of Global Slavery. Uh, he's a professor of economics and global history at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Founded in 1575, Leiden is that country's oldest university and one of the top research institutions in Europe. Having an international perspective has helped him to appreciate the beauty and fragility of his home country of the United States, including its people, its democracy, and its cultural heritage, which is part of the part of Western history. So it's great to have you here as a professional historian. As you know, uh, Professor, um, the topics that you're writing about and that you talk about in your most recent book are very, very prescient in Canada, where the government of Canada is actually about to pass a law uh, called the Online Harms Act would actually, that would actually make it a criminal offense for those of us in Canada to deny the, the sort of uh, genocidal government narrative about 
Indian residential schools. So your book is very timely, and I found it very interesting. It has application not only in Canada but and in the United States. Um, but where I'd like to start is uh, what drew you to this particular aspect of uh, of American history, of North American history, and European history? Because obviously you're widely read, and you comment on a variety of different subjects. What was it that drew you particular to this this uh, this subject matter? Well, Leighton, I mean, the real question for me is how do we create as much prosperity around the globe as possible? This is what brought me to do my PhD research way back in history to find the origins of modern prosperity. And I realized that a lot of the things that provide prosperity came from Europe in the Renaissance and afterwards with the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution and and the human rights that came out of the Enlightenment. All of these things are undeniably cornerstones of what we all take for granted in modern developed societies, and they're being enthusiastically adopted by people around the world. So uh, when people in the 2010s started saying, you know, not only that Europe had committed many sins in its past, which I totally agree with, but when they started saying that Europe was absolutely evil in an absolute sense and that European history revolved around slavery and oppression, I said, wait a minute, I think we're going a little too far here. You know, maybe 20 years ago, historians used to have a good mix of, you know, the fact that Europeans did some bad, uh, plenty of bad in the past, but also plenty of good. Um, But I really think that now with these new genocide narratives, no historian used the term genocide to describe native and European relations in Canada or the U.S. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Almost no historian said that except for a few people on the fringe. And now we see the Canadian government about to declare me an outlaw for arguing what historians used to think was normal 20 years ago. So Mm -hmm. it's really gotten crazily out of hand and somebody had to step in and kind of speak the truth. Mm -hmm. I I expect that this has made you somewhat unpopular in the cloistered halls of academia, though. Because um, I, I, just looking from the outside, as someone who spent many years at university, and things were pretty liberal, small l liberal back then, I know that they've gotten a lot worse. Uh, the word, I guess the word would be woke uh, on, at, at, on, on the top floors of most universities. What's it been like for you? Have you suffered some uh, some some persecution within within amongst your colleagues, or how has that how's that how's that experience been for you in, in public publishing such a courageous book? Well, you know, for many years I was a typical academic liberal myself. I voted Democrat for decades, and uh, you know, supported the the more liberal parties in Canada when I was living there. But I realized that. You know, the entire left side of the spectrum had started marching in the 2010s, like towards the far left. And I feel like I was still pretty centrist, which is where I'd always been. But everybody was running further and further left. So now I find that there are a lot of academics who agree that the, you know, the kind of uber wokeness that we see is is really going too far. It really comes from a position of like the Black Panthers in the 1960s. They're, they're really segregationist in, in a radical way. Right. Um, and but but the discourse has been hijacked by a minority of activists. So the Canadian Historical Association fam- or infamously a couple of years ago put out this statement on Canada Day saying that, yes, cultural genocide had been committed in Canada. When you look at who actually was declaring that, it was a 10-member board who was pushing this through without consulting the membership of the Canadian Historical Association. It was a bunch of activists on the board who put this up, didn't put it to a majority vote because they knew they would get pushed back, but they didn't want to. They just wanted to run with the political narrative that was uh, favorable on Twitter. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you now? Uh, I'm just likening this. And I don't want to overstate the case, but I know, for example, um, in Nazi Germany during the 1930s, um, many academics went along with Nazism. They weren't actually Nazis, but they sort of went with the flow in a kind of a self preservation way. And but there were some activists at the universities who were just as you described ones who were sincerely Nazis. And of course, in the end, one of the first things that Hitler did when he came to power is he cleaned out all those people because he, he thought them dangerous. 
Um, is that sort of the same type of thing that you see happening in, in universities? Then that is that um, many of your colleagues might agree with some of the things that are in your book, but they're afraid. They're afraid to to say that openly because it could cost them their positions or they could suffer cancel culture uh, persecution. Do you think that's uh, that's sort of a, a fair statement uh, that that wokeism is not as universal in, amongst university professors as it might appear? Well, I think it's divided by a uh, section. So the business and the science people don't even know what wokeism really is. They're just too busy being practical, solving practical problems for the most part to worry about all this social theory stuff. So it's really the liberal arts and humanities people that, that are really that we really have to worry about. Um, and I think maybe 30 percent of them, 40 percent of them really disagree with the woke narrative. I think the younger crowd, maybe 30 percent really are gung ho about it. I think a lot of the ones who don't have a lot of perspective on things, they've just grown up on Twitter and they just kind of believe what the herd believes, whatever's fashionable. Um, and so, yeah, um, but I think that a lot of people in the middle really do feel that if they stick their head above the parapet, if they criticize the current wokeness, especially because they've co-opted the idea that, you know, they are on the side of equality. And if you speak against them, that you're a racist, which I completely contest. Right. Um, I argue that they're actually anti-science and becoming anti-rational. <laughs> and anyone who's on the side of rationality and evidence needs to take a more moderate tack. Right. Um, so they end up being like a witch hunting crowd. And yeah, in that kind of environment, it is similar to Germany in the 30s. You, you know, have to toe the party line, especially now that the Canadian government and other uh, boards have been infiltrated by the kind of extreme activist uh, ideology in the last 10 years. So it really does make it dangerous for anyone who wants to criticize it from a career perspective. And most academics don't have the stomach for any kind of personal fight. They don't have enough courage personally to risk their tenure and their cushy position in society yeah. to actually stand up for reason. And that's what I'm trying to galvanize them to be a little more courageous. They are a very important demographic in this, aren't they? Because, you know, they really do have a great influence over the young minds. Our brightest young minds are in the universities. And so your colleagues really do have a significant influence over what's driving the culture of our society, especially going forward, because, you know, it, it's, it's trite to say this, but it really is true. All of our young, all of our future leaders are, are in the halls, uh, you know, are attending the classes uh, in these universities. And so the role of, of academia really is huge in, in this in this whole endeavor, isn't it? Well, and that's the thing. And a lot of these students will pick things up as an undergraduate. They don't have time to reflect on it in a mature fashion. They then go out into the job market and they'll often fast track, get fast tracked to the to the height of some kind of major institution, whether it's in the government, whether it's a library, whether it's an art institute or uh, journalism. And they'll get fast tracked right up. And the last time they were in an environment where they were learning opinions, it was from these kind of ultra woke professors. And a lot of these people will keep these opinions for, for several decades to come, if not longer. Mm -hmm. One of the dangerous things about this is it causes young people to, to lose appreciation for their own culture and, and respect for their own country. I, I saw a recent uh, a, a, a stat um, and I know uh, you're somewhat of an expert on, on slavery and the history of it, but I saw a recent uh, stat on the United States that as many as 12 million black people in the United States have actually emigrated there, that, that were, they were not descendants of slaves. So is it, a, is, it, is it possible that the 12 million people from parts of Africa and other parts of the world uh, who are people of color could be so daft? Or is it that this whole idea of colonialism and, and slavery being foundational to countries like the United States and Canada, is it really false? Is it, is it a false narrative? I, I know where you come down on this, but how, 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 does it, how could this be? How could, be, how could such an irrational idea uh, that faces so much empirical evidence against it uh, be, be so, so ubiquitous? How, how did this happen? How did we get here? 
Well, you know, I think a lot of it, that's a really good question. I think a lot of it is the division that I was mentioning earlier between people who can do numbers, who tend to go into higher paying, uh, more practical fields, and then people who can't really do numbers, who often go into the humanities and liberal arts, if I can be so bold as to say yeah. that. I'm a I'm liberal an, arts grad, so yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I'm a I'm an economic historian, so I can do both. I can right. study the history and the texts, but I also really care about numbers. And so I looked up how many natives were massacred over the whole history of Canada by white people, and the answer is a couple dozen. Okay, we're wow. not talking millions of people. It's right there on oh. Wikipedia. You can look it up. It's in my book. Um, so, and then about as many white people were massacred by natives as vice versa. And it's the same thing in the U.S. 400 years of history, seven or 8,000 natives were massacred, seven or 8,000 white people were massacred by natives. That's it, out of a population of millions of people. So the idea that there was a genocide going on, again, is easy for a lot of young people who pick these ideas up on Twitter to believe. They believe that Christopher Columbus killed 7 million people on the island of Hispaniola, for example, right. when genetic evidence has recently shown there were only 30,000 people living on the island. It'd be pretty hard to kill 7 million people <laughs> when there's only 30,000 there. So people pick these ideas up, but they have no, um, you know, they never see the actual statistics behind what's going on. And if you look at the numbers, even for a second, you see that most of these slogans are completely overblown and they're just kind of what a certain segment of the population wants to hear rather than what's actually in the sources. Right. So this this uh, figure, Christopher Columbus, obviously a, a titan of history and Western culture, maybe in the top five most uh, important people who's who's lived in the past thousand years, um, but he's really taken a serious beating uh, in 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 recent years. Uh, but you know, based on your research, um, if 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 we were if the people watching this were a member of um, you know Christopher Columbus's crew when he landed in, in North America in the Carib in the Caribbean. What would he have actually found? What would he have actually witnessed? Because, of course, the narrative that we get now is that, um, you know, there were sophisticated indigenous societies and so on. But what, what, what actually would he have found based upon your research? Yeah, well, I mean, when Columbus first landed, he would have found uh, people who were essentially living in the Stone Age. Um, and so there were some sophisticated civilizations, of course, with the Aztecs and the Incas, their sophistication level was about the equivalent of 3000 BC in the old world. So about ancient Sumeria, ancient Mesopotamia, right. early Egypt, that's kind of the tech level that the Aztecs were at, mm -hmm. which is really impressive when you consider that the new world only had 10% as many people as the old world. So the new world had actually advanced quite a lot since their ancestors uh, had walked across the land bridge in 15,000 BC during the ice age. So, mm -hmm. um, but Columbus found people on the fringes of that, you know, civilization unit. And so, yeah, they were basically stone age people. Um, they were willing to communicate with Columbus. And at first Columbus's main goal there was to set up trading posts. The goal was not to, to conquer. It was to set up a little trading post and hopefully find China, which he thought was going to be somewhere, you know, on the other side of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, of course, he turned out to be wrong, but he was looking to do what the Europeans had already done in Africa and Asia, which is to set up trading posts only on the coast. He never thought they would be able to replace or exterminate the natives. There were just too many of them. Right. And so that was really the goal from the, from the outset. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, you talk about in your book, obviously talking about stolen land, is this idea that, um, you know, that the land actually belongs to somebody else, that, that, uh, that the people who landed here, the Europeans uh, who civilized the continent of North America, really don't belong here, that they're invaders. And this is a very strange, you know, concept. And um, this, I was talking off the top of the show about uh, these uh, land acknowledgements that we have in the United States and Canada. You've probably heard these. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm an Indigenous person. My great-grandfather was a hereditary chief. Mm 
He was also one of the first Indians in Canada to attend university. Um, but this is the way I see this whole land acknowledgement. Imagine, Jeff, that you're my neighbor and you really like my car. And every day all the neighbors come out in the front stoop and they see you come and, and, and before you get in my car, you say, this is Layton's car. I'm going to drive Layton's car now. And every day all my neighbors and I watch you drive away in, in my car. I'm never getting the car back. And so really this whole thing about land acknowledgement is, is a completely pointless exercise. So my question to you is, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this when, when uh, you know, when Google and, and, uh, and, and companies like that get together for their meetings, they have one of these land acknowledgements, we have them before sporting events. What's going on here? Is this all virtue signaling or is something more, more deeply deconstructive going on in, in these land acknowledgements? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's it's basically a religious ritual at some fundamental level. Religion has been replaced in our societies. And so the secular religion is to try to be as nice to everybody as you can. And it sounds on the surface like the way to be nice is to acknowledge that you're living on stolen land. What could be wrong with that? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I agree with you. There's a deeply, you know, originally 1970s Marxist Howard Zinn kind of desire to take down the, the bourgeois state, the liberal state, as you will, uh, of Canada and the United States and, and destroy capitalism. And so they want to start by undermining the foundations of the Canadian and American nation state and say, you know, these are fundamentally illegitimate societies. They're based on stolen ground. They're based on theft and murder and et cetera. Well, to that I can say, why is it any different if a group of Canadians ended up stealing land from a native tribe, when that native tribe almost certainly had stolen land from another native tribe 50 years before that. So it to me seems almost racist. It's actually weird to acknowledge that if Europeans steal land, it's bad. But if a native tribe steals land, often stealing all the women in the previous tribe and using them as slaves, um, you know, that's often how it was. The men were, would all be killed. The women would be incorporated into the tribe, whether they wanted to be or not. Um, so why is this one European transaction fundamentally different from the history of violence that had already existed on that land? And that's what a lot of people want to bury or hide or cover up, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is uh, in, in your book, you talk about the, the myth of the stolen country. And what you just said, that's essentially the essence of it, right? You're saying that, look, um, the law of conquest is something that has gone on in human affairs from time immemorial for as long as we've been able to record history. And there's really nothing unique about the way that the Europeans came um, and, and, and really took over North America. Is that the essence of it or is it more uh, comprehensive than that? Yeah, I mean, that's only part of the story. I think we need to realize that history is extremely complicated. This is just, you know, I feel like as a professional historian, it's my job to complicate easy shibboleths that you might hear on Twitter. I kind of despise um, intellectual debates that only take place on Twitter because they have to take place in these tiny little frames. Yeah. That's not enough space yeah. to, to give evidence. So, I mean, fundamentally, the French, for example, were fur traders. And that means they ranged all across the interior of the continent with the goal of trading with the natives for several hundred years. That was their main economy in Canada. It was not to exterminate, not to take over, but to befriend and take furs from the natives in, in return for other things. So that's not a story of theft. You know, maybe some later people in the 19th century did end up stealing it, but for hundreds of years, these Europe, these generations of Europeans, their goal was peaceful coexistence and trade. And same thing in England in the 17th and 18th centuries in New England, there was a thriving land market where many native tribes would say, all right, well, we don't need a huge amount of land anymore because we're shifting from hunter gathering to farming. And so when you farm, you only need like less than one one hundredth as much land as you need as a hunter gatherer to sustain yourself with calories. So these tribes found that they had so much extra land that they would just sell it off. And often native real estate agents would work with the Europeans and sell the land and get rather rich. We have many 17th century Native Americans 
becoming wealthy, one even went and visited the King of England uh, as, as, you know, part of a, a trade mission. Um, and so this was a thriving land market where the land east of the Appalachians was mostly purchased, you know, fair and square from the natives. Um, and that's not theft, you know. So, no. so again, that's another aspect of what's going on. And my book is basically saying it's too easy to just say it's all stolen land, which is what's been happening on Twitter in the last 10 years. The truth is it's much more complicated than that. Yeah. And in fairness to to you, in case anybody's listening to this and, and they're thinking that your book is just sort of uh, being dismissive of uh, indigenous cultures and that sort of thing, that isn't really true. In fact, uh, you're very careful uh, in the book, you you say that you're keenly aware of the need to challenge smug, feel good interpretations of of history, and you you acknowledge you understand that nationalism and civilizational pride carry obvious dangers, which were made manifest by the world wars of the 20th century, and you understand that these things can serve as subtle tools not only of racism but of exploitation of many stripes, and and so you're aware of that too that that uh, you're that there there is a balancing that goes on in the book here. Uh, and it's important to note that you're not necessarily dismissive of Indigenous cultures. What you're really trying to say is, as you say it, um, this is a more complex situation. It's not as simple as an old 1930s Western where, you know, the, 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 you know, the bad guys are wearing black hats, uh, you know, and they're and they're chasing Indians around. Um, the, the, this is a, a comp. This history is more complex uh, than than the narrative that, that's being put out there that that unfortunately many people are accepting uh, as as being bald facedly true. Is that a fair is that a fair yeah. assessment of? Yeah, so you wanna... early, I'm glad you brought this up because I seldom get a chance to talk about this in interviews. I mean, I'm an historian uh, of the Spanish Empire. That's one of the hats that I wear. And I've lived in Mexico. I realized that Mexico is a thoroughly hybrid culture, which is part Spanish. But I mean, the majority of people are, are uh, at least half native in Mexico. Right. Um, and North American scholars completely forget that to the south of us, we have this thriving hybrid society, which shows how well the Spanish and the natives actually got along. And there's lots of instances of that in my book. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Canada and the United States, I, I argue that this book is by no means an anti-Indian or anti-Indigenous book at all. And I'm arguing that maybe the woke left by encouraging native youth of today to despise the Canadian nation, to think that they've always been at war with Europeans, to ignore the fact that for centuries, there were so many natives and Europeans who were good friends, who intermarried with each other, who were actively looking out for each other's benefit. I think that we actually do a disservice to native youth today if we tell them this one-sided kind of caricature of a story about genocide. It, 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 I think, causes them to lose a lot of opportunities in present day society, you know, due to anger. And I think, you know, the woke can actually be more to blame for that than a more centrist perspective like I have. I totally agree. And um, uh, I was mentioning to you in some of our correspondence leading up to our interview uh, that I was involved in a book project in Canada. The book is called From Truth Comes Reconciliation. And um, in my forward to that book, I pointed out that in Canada, there was a 3,400 page uh, study. Uh, it, it was called the uh, Sinclair Commission Report. And actually, when you look at that full study, and this won't surprise you, but it surprises a lot of people, the anecdotal stories of people who are in Indian residential schools in Canada, the vast majority of them, well over 80% of the stories were positive ones, yeah. including ones from my own grandmother who spent her whole childhood in one of these schools and who credits her literacy and and her training as a nurse. She, she was a nurse who helped out in a veterans hospital uh, during World War II. Uh, she credits all of that to, to being at the residential school. But unfortunately, sadly, what the Canadian government did in order to sort of import critical race theory into Canadian parlance, what they did is they, they went through and they sifted through and they found all the stories of abuse in those schools, which are inevitable. Anytime you have boarding schools, you have these things happen. And the, but they 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 lifted all that out. They threw away all the rest as so much dross, even though it's truth. And now in Canada, we have this uh, 
narrative, this, this, this genocidal narrative, and it does a great disservice to history and it does a great disservice to our, to, to our country, doesn't it? Uh, and it's a very dangerous, it's a very dangerous thing and very unlike what um, we have come to know of history uh, the, 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 in, in the West, the way that we have recorded and reported history. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that um, one of the strange things that's going on is it actually robs Indigenous people of their agency. And this is so funny because yes. in the humanities and liberal arts, you say, oh, well, we want to make sure we give voice to the voiceless. Well, that's only if the voiceless are saying what you want them to say. As soon as they say something like, look, we were poor, we were living on this or that farmstead. These people came and offered my children an education. And I chose to send my children to that school because I knew it would give them a better life in the society we were in. Right. You know, and of course, that's a practical decision. And yeah. once firearms became advanced enough by the 1860s and 70s that there was not going to be any large groups of wild animals anymore, the buffalo, about 30% of the buffalo that were slaughtered in the 1870s were actually killed by natives with the new style of firearms. Actually, people don't know that either. Um, but basically, hunting and gathering became untenable. People were going to have to settle down. They were going to have to farm because there was no animals left. Technology had moved that way and it was nobody's fault. And so the, the obvious thing to do is to send your kid to school because education has been proven time and again to be by far the number one way to increase your earnings over the course of your life and to increase right. your personal prosperity. It just makes sense. But of course, now they're trying to completely erase this. I mean, the Canadian government is erasing history knowingly yes. and creating this one-sided narrative and then making it illegal to contradict the narrative that they've doctored. I mean, mm -hmm. what is this? I mean, this really does seem like an Orwellian situation. It is. It is. It's, it is dystopian. And, and if the goal is reconciliation, it seems as though this is the the, the antithetical way to go about it. Um, and I'm actually, in in the book I just described, I I wrote a forward to it, and I said this. I said this book is an expression of free speech that will offend people. In so in so doing, it will challenge their preconceived ideas about Indian residential schools, about truth, and about the meaning of reconciliation. But I said if there is to be restoration to friendly relations or the making of one view compatible with another, then we must first abandon the, the this postmodernist infatuation with the pretense of making more responsibility uh, to make amends for the past. That is that is capitulation, not reconciliation. And, and so I, I argue that in order for there to be a true reconciliation in the proper sense, there has to be first an understanding and respect for diversity of opinions and viewpoints about the legacy of things like Indian residential schools. As you say, these problems are more complex than, yeah. than the narrative. And it's only through an examination of all sides of the question, as you do in your book, that we can reach a true understanding of what occurred and why. And it's from that, that intellectual historical sort of plateau, that we might get to a point where we actually experience truth and reconciliation. Would you agree? Would you agree with with my I take on that? I completely agree with the fact that we need a plurality of voices. That's the way science always works. That's the way the business boardrooms of successful companies work. You have people giving different opinions for what ought to happen in the future. And to understand the history of our countries, we need to have a plurality of voices, all giving us different takes on the evidence in order to arrive at the best possible point of view. Um, unfortunately, in the 19th century, the dominant way to look at history was to look at it as an either or kind of thing. And this happened right, right up to the Marxism of the 1960s and 70s. You were either bourgeois or proletariat, you know. Okay. Um, and so then the critical theory adopted the same thing. You're either a patriarchal oppressor or you're a feminist uh, oppressed person. Right. You know, and of course, everybody knows there's all sorts of in-betweens in every social situation. So... Unfortunately, I thought as historians in the 1990s, we had finally moved past this simplistic, essentially 19th century view of the way history works. But I think with Twitter and with social media, it's come back again. It's just too easy to have an in-group and an out-group, a right and a wrong. And so we're seeing science being distorted across the board and everyone trying to peg things into one of two holes. As I think we both agree, you know, anyone with an ounce of common sense realizes that's too simple and it can cause a lot more problems than it solves.
Mm -hmm. And one of the things that bothers me a lot about uh, the sort of, you know, let's call it binary view of history that you're talking about is that it does a great disservice to the people who live through that history. So, for example, and you talk, you, you talk about this in your book, you know, um, there's a great struggle. It took a great struggle, a great human endeavor to, to settle and to colonialize and to bring civilization to North America. It, it wasn't a snap of a finger. Uh, there, there was a lot that went into that. And speaking about the Indian residential school experience, the thing that bothers me there is that the vast majority of people who worked in those schools were there for the right reasons. You know, they were either very devout Christians uh, or, or they wanted to help children uh, or they were, they were people who had true humanitarian motives. And they did a lot of good in those schools. They helped a lot of children. Uh, but their stories are just swept away in this tide of wokeness. And, uh, and to me, that's one of the most um, painful things about seeing this, uh, this narrative destroy all that is that we're losing the precious history of all those people who really made North America, you know, what it is or what it was until, you know, five seconds ago when we started tearing it all down. It's, it's really a, a miracle. And, and if you think of Canada, and the United States, you know, the most welcoming countries maybe in the history of, of the world. And yet, uh, you know, we're just tearing ourselves down and calling ourselves all kinds of names. Um, but do you agree with me about that, that we're losing, as a historian, we're actually losing appreciation for our history uh, through all of this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, in this rush to create this simplified narrative, we're forgetting so many good impulses that were going on in Canada and the U.S. I mean, Benjamin Franklin's grandfather, way back in the 1670s, was writing poems against the King William's War, uh, the massacre of the Indians during that war. I mean, so he's writing anti-war propaganda from the point of view of natives saying they are people too, they are equals, we should be negotiating, not, not fighting. You know, so that's all the way back then. And then, you know, the Europeans introduced smallpox, but Thomas Jefferson, within a few years of the smallpox vaccine being created, sent it west with Lewis and Clark, and tens of thousands of natives were inoculated over the course of the 19th century. Nobody talks about this humanitarian impulse that was all in order to save lives. That's why these people were doing it. So absolutely i agree that you know people are forgetting that the trail of tears was protested by ralph waldo emerson by mm -hmm. the u.s supreme court actually rendered it uh, said that it was illegal so you know there are so many positive things that the left could be looking at and saying hey these are our ancestors these are our forebearers they were being you know pro-humanitarian pro-equality with the natives since the beginning that story's always been there. And now since, again, since the 2010s, this is being completely lost. Right. And now, so they're, they're, they're knocking over statues of, of, uh, of Columbus and, and Abraham Lincoln and Sir John A. Macdonald in Canada. Yeah. Uh, why are they doing it? What's behind this? It seems to be a huge power grab. But what's behind it? Is it, is, is it that simple or am I oversimplifying that? What, why is the left so intent upon uh, really erasing, to use your word, uh, you know, this, this history, all the, all the best parts of our history, um, uh, with, with an eraser that's ba that's based on lies, how, how, and why are they doing this? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think they realized that they had a moment that uh, the internet had created or social media had created this moment, which galvanized the left in a way that we haven't seen since the 1970s with the hippie movements and everything else. So, yeah. They realized they had to act fast. And one of the obvious things to do is these symbolic pulling down of the statues, you know, George Washington, McDonald, anybody they could get their hands on. Uh, and that was really planting their flag. I think you're right. It was a power grab. Um, and it also encouraged uh, elites across Canada and the United States um, to start implementing more, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion um, things, which in many ways end up being prejudicial. They, they again, destroy meritocracy. They make suspicion between racial groups, which didn't previously exist. So I think that they're using this as a justification to push further ideas. And, and these land acknowledgements that you were talking about before, that's another kind of religious or symbolic marker. You know, it's turf being claimed. And, and I think you're very much correct that that's what they're trying to do because they realize 
that in the end, only about 15% of the population, you know, considers themselves truly liberal. Um, most people are pretty middle of the road, actually, uh, as voters. And so they're, they're seizing this moment while they have it. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you know, internationally, the United Nations is getting into the act. Um, there's something called the UNDRIP or United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, which I've looked at recently and commented upon. And it, it looks as though basically it's like a, I call it a globalist Trojan horse, where essentially what they want to do is disentitle uh, the owners of land, the present owners of land, uh, you know, in Canada and places like Canada and other parts of the world in order to give it back supposedly to indigenous peoples to what end uh, suspiciously I'm suspicious um, that it's part of deconstructing nations uh, as part of, as part of globalism. So that for example, in British Columbia, which I mean, we're actually not supposed to say British Columbia anymore, if you can believe it. Um, they're, they're, we're actually, they're, they're actually very close to seeding huge parts of Vancouver the largest city in British Columbia, uh, to, to indigenous groups. Um, so does, is that, do you see this, uh, this sort of being part of a, a broader globalist objective, uh, to sort of, uh, break down, uh, you know, traditional nation states like Canada and the U S or wh where do you see this going if it isn't stopped? You know, here's where my roots as a Renaissance historian, I think, give me perspective that most people don't have. And I saw how for centuries in Europe, rulers struggled against local jurisdictions, which were almost always hotbeds of corruption and oppression. So if we take Canadian land now, crown land, whatever it is, and give it back to small groups of indigenous people that you can only belong to by birth or by some kind of secret vote that nobody really knows how you exactly get membership in. You're taking the land away from the market in general and, and general ownership of the vast majority of the population and giving it to maybe one or two percent. This is a perfect way to then have them, you know, not honor laws. A lot of times more abuse of children or women might go on in these in these little uh, cliques. And it is absolutely a regression towards a feudal state. Mm -hmm. This is not the way a modern nation state should be. Everybody is a member of the nation state, no matter who you are. Um, you know, you could be a black person in the United States and then you're like, well, where's my land? You know, why don't I get a whole half of the city dedicated to me and this other uh, minority group? Why is it Native Americans who get this uh, this mm -hmm. uh, privilege when we may have been slaves in the past? So um, it's it's basically completely unfair and irrational. And I can see how if people want to deconstruct nation states, this would be one of the fundamental, you know, practical ways to start doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that um, these tribal identities, whether it's along race lines or, or, or culture or whatever, um, that, that they're sort of tribal. It's a, it's a more primitive t type of identity. Um, than 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 a nation state. A nation state, I sort of see as a as a banner, like a flag, uh, where we can all be part of it, even though we might have differences in religion, uh, you know, differences in language, differences in in culture. We might eat different different food, um, but we can be we can be united under that one banner. This is sort of the brilliance of the nation state of a flag, like for example, you know, the stars and stripes. You know, at a football game, the Super Bowl. Everybody can put hand to heart and salute that flag and we can be part of one thing. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of this, uh, the stuff that you talk about in your book, this sort of tribalism is designed to break that down and to almost promote this Marxist type conflict. Uh, Marx talked about class conflict, but it seems to me that the neo-Marxists are, are, are sort of weaponizing these these concepts so that we have conflict based on race, uh, you know, gender, you know, sexual orientation, all this stuff. So that uh, it seems as though today we're, we've never been more divided, at least in my lifetime, than we are right now. Um, is this is this part of the objective that the left is trying to achieve? Yeah, well, I mean, they're effectively balkanizing society. And I think that a lot of the groups who are doing this, again, are hailing from a sort of far left group, um, which in the 1960s consisted of, say, black nationalists who actually wanted black and white segregation in the U.S., but from the black 
perspective. So sure, like I a mean, Malcolm X. Not yeah, weirdly racist. Uh, yeah. I don't know what is. Most people realize pretty quickly that that was a poisonous idea. But you know, now we're seeing it again. Uh, I completely agree in a way that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. I open book reviews of the history of slavery from the year 2012. And there are academics in Canada and the United States who say, well, racism is basically a thing of the past. No one needs to write about race anymore. What a silly idea. You know, Obama had been elected president. We thought we'd kind of, you know, gotten to this big glass ceiling had been smashed. Um, And I think the far left kind of freaked out after the U.S. elected Obama because they thought, you know, basically most of these far left people who care about race are kind of racist themselves. Let's say they only care about their own in group. Everybody else is other. Right. Um, and I think they were afraid that with the U.S. electing a black president, there wouldn't be any grounds for them to claim victimization anymore. And so they started pulling out the critical race theory. And unfortunately, that's when BLM starts. And the, a lot of radical indigenous groups latched onto the success of BLM, uh, with, which never would have happened without social media. Mm -hmm. But you, you talk about in your book, uh, obviously you, you debunk a lot of the myths, uh, that we've been talking about today. Um, and you expose them as myths. In other words, something that really has no empirical basis. In fact, uh, that, that really is an insupportable conclusion. Um, and you talk about the importance of education. That's why you wrote the book. Um, what do you see as some other solutions uh, to the, sort of the antidote to this chaos? Do you, do you see other ways, things that, that, uh, that people can be doing uh, to help to, to, to get back to a place or perhaps move forward to a place where we are more united and we're not, we're not so uh, hypercritical of our culture and then trying to tear it all down? Um, uh, I'm interested to know what you think about what's the way forward. Is there a path forward where we're going to get to a place where we're not so divided and we're not so uh, hateful of our own country and, and of Western culture in general? I think that conservatives need to articulate a vision about society and education, which is actively inclusive, which is actively anti-woke, which exposes wokeism as divisive which sells itself not only to conservatives, but also to the center of the political spectrum and says some of the things we've just been saying, the nation state in its most uh, developed form, especially the English language nation state, which we've inherited English institutions in Canada and the US, um, they have such wonderful workings for creating progress through democratic vote, through participation, through inclusion, we just need to remember what everybody used to know in Canada and the United States before about the year 2010. But the conservatives need to articulate that as an inclusive message. We don't need to exclude anybody if they're willing to, you know, come to the table and participate in this great uh, experiment. So um, it shouldn't be that difficult. And then People need to participate at the local level. I study the history of democracy in detail, and I realized that one of the reasons why, for example, the Iraq experiment failed uh, with the U.S. trying to barge in there and set up a democracy, they had thought as soon as they took down the dictator that uh, democracy would just suddenly flourish. Well, people need to be used to democracy at the local level. You know, they need to be participating. They need to be debating with one another at the local level. And this is where, you know, we need kind of grassroots activists to come in to school boards and to um, to local and, and provincial governments and say, hey, I'm going to stand up for Canada. Now, Orwell said one of the saving graces uh, against uh, doublespeak in the 1930s and 40s and a, a kind of disillusion with politics is a bedrock of nationalism. Mm. But I think that we might be in a situation now where that bedrock of nationalism has been actively eroded by wokeness to such a degree that if China, say, attacks um, uh, large parts of Asia and threatens global security and sea lanes, I don't know if Canada and the U.S. are going to find that bedrock of patriotism, which will galvanize a response. So conservatives on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border really need to think hard about how we're going to defend our societies against attack. And that comes 
through first preparing the populace to actually respect and care about the good things in our society, which are manifold. They're all over the place. If we, mm -hmm. if we care to look. Yes. Yes. And there's much, there's much to lose. Um, yeah. I, I feel as though my, my thought is that, you know, uh, and your book points to this, um, how much we take, uh, we take our wealth for granted. And I, when I say wealth, I, I don't mean just money. I mean, our, you know, our culture, our culture history, artistic history, um, our history of uh, humanitarianism, of helping other people around the world. Um, there's so many things to be proud of in North America. Uh, so, so, so many great things that have been achieved. And if we take our history for granted and we feel allowed to be erased, um, you know, that would be, uh, you know, something that really would be a great, great tragedy. Uh, and that's one of the things I really like about your book is that, you know, it, it helps people realize how precious what we have in places like United States and Canada uh, is. And then and if we don't make the right steps now, we don't care enough about it, as you say, to get involved, to be active politically um, and to conserve it, which is the true sense of conservatism, mm -hmm. um, then we, we, we risk losing all of it, don't we? Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, I, I live in Europe now and I see how many European people are traveling to Africa all the time to be part of NGOs to help develop, to help people lift themselves up by their own bootstraps, right? Yeah. And the last several decades, there's so many Canadians and Americans who work for institutions who may, whose main goal is to promote the rule of law, to promote world peace, to promote human rights around the world. There's massively positive track records in, in both of those countries. And to ignore that, to think that somehow can, Canada's rotten to the core, you know, uh, to ignore all of the progress that's been made. I mean, we were on track before COVID to eliminate um, absolute poverty in Africa and the whole world by the year 2030. Now it's been pushed back a bit. But most of that is active efforts on the part of Western organizations with people whose concern is to try to help, just like many Canadians were doing in the 19th century with Native Canadians. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all right there for anybody if they care to look. Mm -hmm. Well, one, of, one, one positive sign, perhaps, is that the governments in the U.S. and Canada that right now are in power and are pushing all this stuff are massively unpopular. So that's at least a sign of hope that there are people who really are rejecting uh, some of the narratives, some of the false narratives, the, the myths that you've been talking about here and that you explain in your book. Well, Professor, uh, this has just been a great conversation I, and I'm so grateful for your, for your time and your knowledge. Um, we turn to uh, something we have on our show called The Reading List. And of course, uh, I expect that uh, you've read many, many books that would enhance the understanding of people listening and watching to this uh, and, and watching this about this topic. Um, I've got uh, three books that I'm going to recommend. Obviously, your book, uh, which is called Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World. And uh, we've been talking about that book, book extensively. I've read this book. I think it's just uh, wonderful. And it has uh, a, a great history of the United States, but, but also blends in aspects uh, and i really appreciate how you blended in aspects of canadian history as well which are very relevant uh, because we have this shared history uh in in north america uh, in let's call it english north america mm -hmm. leaving quebec aside um you know uh, and and i really appreciate that part of the book because it helped me to understand some of the things that are going on in canada mm -hmm. just looking at the american perspective and how you viewed what's going on in canada the other book that I, uh, I'm recommending is one that's uh, about 25 years old, but it's very prescient. It's by uh, an American um, uh, economist who I admire very much, Dr. Thomas Sowell, who might be the greatest living intellectual. Uh, 93 years old, but he's written more great books after the age of 80 than most people have read. <laughs> uh, so this book was uh, the culmination of 15 years of research and travels that he took completely around the world twice. Uh, he went to the Mediterranean, the Baltic, around the Pacific Rim. And it's pr his purpose was to try and understand the role of cultural differences within nations and between nations today and over centuries of history in shaping the economic and social fates of peoples and of whole civilizations. And so he focuses on four major cultural areas, the British, Africans, African diaspora, the Slavs of Eastern Europe, and the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. 
And it reveals a pattern that, that encompasses not only these peoples, but others and helps to explain the role of cultural evolution in economic, social, and political development. And that book, uh, it sort of uh, foresees uh, some of the trends that have been played out over the past 25 years. And that's not unique about a Thomas Sowell book, by the way. <laughs> uh, the third book is a Canadian book, the one that I referenced. Uh, uh, it's by written by a, a friend of mine uh, named uh, Dr. Rodney Clifton, who is a retired professor from the University of Manitoba. And this is an assessment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. But what it does is it, it actually looks at the hard data of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, report. And much like uh, uh, our, our guest book, it, it debunks many of the myths that Canadians are being told about Indian residential schools. Um, and actually, it, it came about before the famous Kamloops uh, hoax. Um, I'm going to call it a hoax now because pretty soon it's going to be uh, criminal for me to say that. But, you know, um, it, it debunks a lot of these myths and it tells the truth about, the, about what actually happened in Indian residential schools. And what I love about this book is it pays homage to the many, many people who dedicated their lives at those schools to educating children. And that was the reason why they were there. They weren't there to abuse them. They weren't there to, to sodomize them or anything like that. Those things are documented and, and sometimes they happen. But that was not the overarching experience of Indian residential schools based upon the hard data that the authors here look at based on anecdotal evidence of what people's experiences were at Indian residential schools. So I think this one is a, is a must read for anybody who wants to truly understand uh, not only the, the Canadian experience at Indian residential schools, but also to understand it in the broader context of Canadian and North American history, the relationship between quote unquote colonials and the, and the colonized. Uh, because as uh, our professor, uh, our guest today has said, this is a more complex relationship. It's not a black and white thing. There, there, there aren't easy explanations or answers here. We really need to get down in the weeds and really look at, at what happened. So, um, Professor, those are the books that I'm recommending today. Uh, are, are there one or two that you would recommend to our listeners and, and viewers? Yeah, my goodness, there's so many, but I'll, I'll steer away from some that are more or overtly political. I mean, I think a good blueprint for how to write American history without being woke is Land of Hope by Wilford McClay. That just came out a few years ago. I don't know if there's an equivalent in Canada right now, but he basically just says, hey, this is a balanced history of the United States. We acknowledge some bad was done, but this is... These are the main stepping stones in American history that made America what it is today, generally with a positive, uh, you know, content and spin on the great achievements that, that the United States has accomplished. That would be one. And the other one, the historian in me wants to recommend the Cambridge history of the native peoples of uh, the new world. And that mm. is a six volume book. And it sounds wow. crazy, but there's a bunch of chapters and they're available online at local libraries. Oh, so the, the, the Cambridge history of the indigenous peoples of the new world. And there you can look up any topic, you know, Canada in the 19th century, Canada in the 20th century, U.S. in whatever century. And you can see the scholarship as it was around the year 2000. Um, it's meant for the general reader, actually, for undergraduate students. And this is a baseline if you're serious about learning more history that you can go from and then you'll be able to distinguish where the more modern woke authors are, are changing things. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, th those are great selections. And I have to ask, uh, is there another book in the offing for you? Are, are you? are you working on anything right now that we can look forward to reading? Yeah, I um, am now working on a history of Western civilization that talks about the stepping stones to modernity. So the way that Western civilization has created the modern prosperity that all of us anywhere in the world, Japan, South Korea, can all enjoy, but making sure people realize what the real roots of those are before they just trash Europe and European history in general. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a wonderful book, but it's, it sounds like painting one bullseye on yourself wasn't enough. You're about to oh, paint yeah. another one because, uh, you know, Western civilization is, uh, 
Uh, they're very much uh, under attack, as you know. Uh, in fact, yeah. um, in fact, your book might be, you know, viewed and one view of the matter might be uh, an explanation of, of one aspect of how that's being done. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I think of Douglas Murray's book, The War on the West. Mm. Um, great book, uh, but, you know, he's taken a lot of heat for it. So God bless you for being so courageous and taking on these very important, difficult topics, uh, because unfortunately, uh, so few people in academia who could write great books about this stuff just aren't aren't prepared to do it. So very, very grateful for your work and also for you taking the time to be our special guest today on Grey Matter. Best of luck with your new book and everything that you're doing. Much continued success. Thanks so much, Leighton. It was a real pleasure to be on. Thank you.